Selamat datang di Uncensored with Andini Effendi. Saya penasaran banget dengan isu di sekitar kita yang kita paham mereka ada, tapi kita selalu menutup mata dan tidak membicarakannya. Atau the elephant in the room. Episode ini kita akan belajar banyak mengenai apa itu dominatrix dan industri seks bersama teman saya, Diva O, seorang international dominatrix. Inilah Uncensored with Andini Effendi. Where were you born? Like, tell me, tell me about it. Like, uh, where were you raised? Tell me everything. So I was born in Southeast Asia and I was raised there as well as Australia and a little bit in China and a little bit in Spain. Um, uh, and then I would say that uh, it was very sweet <laughs> and loving. I realized how much love I got um, now as an adult in comparison to how much a lot of other people go through and I don't know despite being here and there and everywhere I, I still felt fairly stable with my family and um, the usual here and there I did a communications at university the first time and then I did social work the second time and uh, yeah I started off um, my professional career as a performance artist <laughs> what kind of, what kind of performance that, artist yeah. Performance artist. Yeah, did you know that? No, I didn't know that. What kind? Is it like a dancer or what? Yeah, so I've been dancing ballet since I was about four. Oh, um, I heard. I, I remember the story, ballet, yes. And then? Yeah, yeah. But I joined this very small, kind of like Cirque du Soleil style circus um, out of Spain when I was 20-ish, 21. And um, I toured around with them for a year or two years. Uh, yeah, but uh, that didn't stick too much because I went into production, in event production, as like um, a, something that offshoot from that. And it's been all over the place since then, as, as you kind of know. I've worked with the UN. I've had my own sustainable design company. I've uh, worked as a strategic consultant. Uh, and yeah, and now I'm here. <laughs> right. And, and what, at one point, you were like a graphic designer, was it? No, no, never. Um, I did do a little bit of that when I used to run. I've done all sorts of random things. When I used to run events, I used to run these techno jazz parties in Shanghai. And uh, I did a little bit of that then. But other than that, I didn't really. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then so you you worked for the UN at some point. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I was. Um, What was the uh, activity or position? Yeah, so the role was for a special project, and um, it started off just as a registrations officer, but then they realized that I could write, um, and uh, even though it wasn't creative writing they were looking for, but I could write enough, and they moved me into a research role, and uh, I did a lot of research and wrote a couple of reports for them on different, um, yeah, refugee movements, and... This was in Asia? Where was it? Where was where was it the the work? It was in Malaysia. In it Malaysia, in okay, okay. Oh wow, interesting. Mm, for the Rohingya population, mostly. Oh yeah. wow! So you've been doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and then, uh, so tell me, like, what was like the 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 starting point when you enter? I guess the sex industry. Yeah. So. It was a little bit fragmented in that um, an ex-partner of mine made the suggestion as a joke one day. (laughs) Like an ex-boyfriend? This, this? Yeah, an ex-boyfriend. Okay. Um, Because of my communication style, I think. And uh, it it was a partial joke. And uh, I just kept the word dominatrix at the back of my mind. I didn't really think anything of it. But when I had um, moved to Sydney and I had this strategic consulting job, I, it was the first time that I'd worked under contract as opposed to a freelance job. And I realized how much I did not enjoy um, the subject matter, uh, basically working <laughs> to target people's vulnerabilities <laughs> for corporate gain. <laughs> it didn't really sit very well with me as a, um, as a permanent position. And so after my probation, I thought, no, I can't do this. What am I going to do? And you know, because sex work is decriminalized in New South Wales and Australia, this was an opportunity. And so I thought I would give it a go. What year was that? Oh, 2011, I think. 
2011. Okay. So what kind of like, if I can delve more into it, like what kind of like sex work that are we talking about here? Hmm. So when I first started, I found a dungeon, a BDSM fantasy establishment, I guess you could say. And uh, they brought me on board. They did a little bit of training here and there. And I was on their books fairly, fairly quickly. But everybody was an independent, um, you know, he had an Australian business number and everything. So everybody was independent. We just shared the premises, so to speak. Uh, And then shortly after that, I uh, joined another agency that did not fetish work, but straight work. So escorting. Um, but I realized after about a year that that was not necessarily for me. I was more into the BDSM psychological side of things um, rather than uh, vanilla non-kink dynamics. And yeah, and so those were the main things that I tried out then. But what really stuck, obviously, 10 over years later was the BDSM kink fantasy fetish creative almost experience. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so maybe for our audience, they're not too familiar with this term or even, right? Like when you say B- BDSM, King, like explain more about it. Okay, so BDSM is, uh, I would say, an identity, a subculture um, of uh, psychologies and practices where people are playing with bondage, dominance, submission, masochism, um, and uh, or what, what they sometimes say, yeah, dominance and submission, and sadomasochism. And I'm not sure if you're aware of these terms, but basically they are ways of exploring human sexuality and the mind through power dynamics, such as hierarchy, I am in charge of this situation, I'm going to follow it as well as playing with maybe things such as pain. However, pain is not always a component for many people when it comes to this. So yeah, I would say that it's a way to explore your identity and your sexuality and frame that in a way with other people in in something that's become a community. Yeah. Right. So you mentioned pain. Uh, A lot of people associated pain with like, oh, that's creepy or that's freaky. Is 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 that it? Is it is it like a freakiness or is it something that like what you said is exploring your your identity yourself? Yeah, I think when you're not um, aware of things in a deeper fashion, or you haven't given the time, or if you you know have cultural blocks, which are totally normal, then it's pretty easy to jump to thinking something is strange or that it's not acceptable. But I think that when you step outside of your cultural framework, which I guess somebody who has moved around so much, it can be a little bit easier for me to do. You start to realize that the human mind is vast and that the way that we interact has been limited for many reasons. And so things such as pain, such as hierarchies, such as these things can be things that we can play with. So would I say that pain is freaky? I would say that that is making very simple (laughs) light of something that can be very complex. And so if you really give pain and suffering a thought, uh, sometimes, you know, it can be very close to a concept of pleasure and it can be very close to a concept of trust. It can be a tool to really deepen uh, an exchange with somebody as well as yourself. I mean, I used to meditate a a hell of a a lot, maybe I took it to a bit of an extreme, but um, there's this point when you start to understand that pain is such a concept of your mind and you can really push yourself past much further than you're telling yourself to. And so it can also be a very personal experience, but that can be totally independent of BDSM as well. Okay. Okay. So what, what I, I'm just curious, like when you first try it, right? Uh, were you already familiar with that concept? Oh, I, I think partially ignorance and partially uh, adventurous. <laughs> but I didn't know anything about it. I just um, had a little Google and a little read of their website and went for an interview and just thought, I'm just going to give this a go and see how it works out. I knew nothing. I'd never seen 
a flogger, which is a basic um, like a impact play tool that you might see, you know, with lots of leather uh, yeah. strands off of it. I've never seen one of those. I've definitely never seen the inside of a play space or a cage or or anything. And it was just the psychology of it that brought me in, that somebody said that me as an assertive communicator would be good in this role. I'm like, what does that mean? Is this a space for me? Let me just see what this is. So, but the very first day that I was there, I did my first session and as soon as I had somebody in front of me wanting that kind of attention from me, wanting me to be in charge, wanting me to, to impart my desires onto them, I remember the whole room was filled with mirrors and I just had this like incredible smile on me that hasn't gone away. You know, it's just like a space where me as an assertive female is free to reign and I was so happy about that and I still am yeah uh, so what was like your experience like I mean like, what was your takeaway after that after the first day yeah. it's so much to process you know when you when you when I have gone through the world trying to bite my tongue and trying to keep myself keep my ideas um safe and non-threatening to the world around me, which I think is often what a lot of women have to do in a man's world. Uh, it was so many emotions all at once. It was very, incredibly liberating, a lot of like joy. I, I didn't process it quickly at all. Yeah, I just had to keep at it. And it only really like sinks in even lately, you know, how how much this world has brought a uh, realization to my personality. Interesting, because when, when I think of like dominatrix and then you're there in control, right, of whoever is in it and then uh, longing, as you said, like longing for your attention, needing you, whatever, it felt like you have control of it. You know, as a woman, you have the control of it. Is that something that that you feel, I guess? I don't know, because this is like an outsider seeing it through um, a helicopter lens. No, I would say that is <laughs> that is the whole <clears throat> concept of what being a dominatrix <laughs> is, that people are coming to you for that experience. Whether they truly believe it, whether it's a fantasy that they're fulfilling for a moment in time, that's why people are seeing a dominatrix. Sometimes people just want a specific fetish satisfied. So maybe they just want to be spanked and they're not interested in the power dynamic. That does happen. But the way that I practice it, I prefer all that there's always a power dynamic, that there's always an element of me in charge. Yeah. Wow. Well, okay, another curiosity. Is there always like an intercourse during the session? Oh, no. Pretty much never. Yeah. yeah, I would say that um, it's not off the cards. I know, I'm sure some people probably practice it, but even in um, personal uh, relationships, when it comes to BDSM, uh, femdom, female dominance, and uh, it's not penetrative sex is, you know, an aspect, but there's so many other things that can be interacted with that it's almost irrelevant <laughs> yeah oh wow oh wow that's interesting so it's like a non-physical no wait it is physical right but it's not is there's no intercourse but there's a lot of things other than sex i guess yeah. well that, that that the thing is that even when you are having penetrative sex and you know heteronormative environments that there's still a lot of psychology going on. It's like how, like you want to be there, you want to feel connected with somebody, you want to feel held or you want to hold, you know, or you want to be like your breath taken away. There's a lot of psychology going on. It's whether people are thinking about it or not. And then when it comes to my job, it's for me to really think about those things and how do I play with those things? Is it my tone of voice? Is it where I sit them in a room? Is it what I'm wearing? Is it how I change the lights? Is it how tight I, I put this thing on their wrist? You know, it's like building that tension and bringing that excitement and bringing that connection and understanding between us. There's, um, yeah, there's so much that you can do with that and it doesn't have to 
<laughs> take take anything entering anything to to make that happen oh wow so what what do you learn from i guess from other people from your clients yeah with this dynamics that you encounter in each session like you mentioned a lot about psychology so what do you learn about about them <sighs> I don't know if there's anything definitive yet, aside from the fact that I would say most people want to feel connected to somebody else, and they do that through feeling um, understood and accepted. I would say that's probably the only overarching commonality. Um, but aside from that, <laughs> I mean, even now, after seeing so many people for a long-ish time, It, people are really complex and you can never really guess what what is around a corner yeah and that can be exciting and interesting and terrifying <laughs> yeah people are very complex when you start to um be entrusted with their vulnerabilities yeah. interesting wow oh wow yeah so and you might know that also a little bit as somebody who interviews people right Yeah, true, true. That is true. Like, I learned that people can be, like, expressive or sometimes you got to dig in more, right? It's all about psychology. I, 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 that's why I maybe in a way I can relate because the interaction. Yeah, I think so. Right? Yeah. And then also, like, so we're talking about uh, the clientele because um, these are not just an ordinary people, right? It takes, like, what, what kind of, like, type of characteristic or... or So social structure that can be part of this or, or can be a client? I think they're very ordinary, actually. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah? There's a lot of very ordinary people who I session with, who I'm just not friends with and wouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. Because we just don't share the same interests or the same lifestyle, you know? There's a lot of people who compartmentalize um, their interest in this and uh, they just see me every now and then and they go back to their lives their nine to five jobs and their responsibilities that's I would say most of the people who come to see me for sure and most of the people who practice this um, personally also privately but I would say that they're not necessarily going to people be people who are my friends because uh, I guess as a sex worker you can be quite difficult for people to uh, integrate into their lives sadly because of a, a lot of stigma right so i would say they're very ordinary <laughs> yeah. are, 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 are the majority are married men usually who come to see me yeah well no no not necessarily i would say that you know it's a mixture because of um how much i charge these days which is a thousand us an hour which is exorbitant compared to thousand per hour per hour okay yeah And I started at maybe a hundred an hour, you know. So obviously that means that only a certain subsector can see me. Um, however, when I was more affordable, <laughs> I, it was all sorts. It was really, really all sorts, all genders, uh, all sorts of um, socioeconomic statuses, all sorts of jobs, all sorts of interests. Yeah, it was. It can be anybody. I think it can be anybody who just recognizes uh, their love for feet which is actually incredibly common or it could be somebody who yeah is just ready to be curious about their sexuality and they want to try something different i don't think it has to be anything more than that really oh you mentioned like different gender so women can also be your client oh yes yeah yeah women yeah non-binary people for, for sure yeah sexuality lives in everybody <laughs> that's true it, it, it's true i mean people when we think about sex worker it's like female and the client will be male that's like the stereotype right mm -mm. yeah and that can be the case and maybe um more mm, traditional or heteronormative societies but i would say that in a lot of um Uh, probably Western uh, city centers these days where queer culture has like a, uh, more space, that there's definitely a mixed, more mixed clientele because people are a little bit more open about um, their sexuality and wanting to fulfill that. Right, right. So I remember because I met uh, you in Bali at that time and then uh, we were during during the pandemic. So you were like staying put 
for quite some time at that point. And then you tr- start to travel again. And we thought like, oh, you're seeing your client, etc. And I was like, uh, I, and then I asked you like, oh, these are the people that you already know. You're like your old clients, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yeah. So is it like a having a relationship? I guess it's like your your pseudo boyfriend. I don't know. I don't know how to how to like define it. You know? Yeah. yeah. Some of them, when you see them for however many years, you know, and and you see them on a, such an intimate level because they are revealing parts of themselves to you that maybe they haven't revealed to anyone before. There's an attachment that forms for sure. And I react to loyalty. And so there's an attachment that grows on my side also. Would I say that they are boyfriend? No. <laughs> Would I say that they're a partner of sorts? Some of them can be. And um, usually we use the term when it comes to female dominance that we have submissives, that we have submissive people who serve us, who are our partners. Um, yeah. And so I would still say that they're clients, but uh, it's, yeah, you are moving in in areas of intimacy in yourself and in other people. And so it can, even if you try to keep those um, boundaries clear, it can definitely merge a little bit. Mm. Yeah. Do you try to keep it like very, this is professional? You know, yeah. Love with me? So? <laughs> yeah, it can be pretty hard for people because um, like I said, they expose their vulnerabilities to you and they feel very connected. And so it's very personal for them. And it is personal for me as well in a way that I am sharing intimate parts of me as well. However, I keep it as... um separated as I can by making sure that there's always money with the exchange and uh, trying to re-clarify the roles from time to time. But yeah, it can get difficult, of course. Oh, wow. So let's talk about sex work in general, because I know you're also very uh, passionate in this, right? You you did like a documentary, if I'm not mistaken, was it? Mm, no, I've done like a few, oh, well, I've been in a few things. Yes. Yes, yes. I read, I read like articles, like you, what your point of view regarding this, etc. So the stigma, we mentioned it earlier about the stigma of a sex worker. So, uh, no, knowing from the inside, as an insider, what can you do to make it different, the stigma differently, not as negative as what it is? Well, I mean, even myself, when I came into this, right, I was so confused about, is this sex work? What does that mean? What does that make me? Um, How do I feel about this? Because growing up, you know, mostly Asian and in a society that uh, can be quite, you know, structured and it craves that structure and not moving outside of it like a lot of societies but I feel like it can be even more so uh, in Asia where there isn't necessarily a social um, system like a that supports it and so we have our relationships to depend on and that kind of makes it very important for us to have structure but yeah how can we overcome that stigma for me it's from living it <laughs> and the the things that have come up against me and the questions that have come up against me and i've had to tell myself that's kind of helped me to move into spaces where i understand things but i think for other people i don't think it has to be so complicated i think it can just be simple as simple as you know listen to what an actual sex worker has to say alongside your cultural framework you don't even have to change it but just open your ears a little bit listen to this interview listen to what so many other sex workers have to say before you speak for them and then it can grow maybe from there but I think that's probably the number one thing we're human too we have a voice listen to that and not something that somebody else has said about us you know I think that's probably the the thing that makes a difference for me yeah, uh, your 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 closest family, I guess your parents or members of your family, your reaction when you decided to focus on this industry? Yeah, I was terrified to tell them because um, they are Christian and like my mother even teaches Bible study. <laughs> it's like very dedicated. And, um, you know, there's a lot of conservatism, conservatism around um, sexuality in that religion. And on top of that, 
the uh, culture that we're coming from. So I was terrified to tell them, and I didn't tell them for seven years. <laughs> I don't know how I managed to keep that. So, so they just recently oh, wow. learned about it, then. Sorry. So they just recently learned about it. Yeah, three, three, four years ago. Okay. Uh, and <laughs> I organized this trip to tell them. I didn't tell them. I'd like put it in the family chat after they left. I'm such a coward. <laughs> but then my mother was like, really? I, obviously, she Googled it. She had no idea what it was. She was like, really? Is that what you're doing? Okay, I have no questions right now, but, but maybe we can speak later. And then we acted like nothing had been said. And then about a month later, we met again. And as soon as we were alone, she asks me, like, so what is your motivation behind it? What is their motivation behind it? What does that look like? How does that go on when you're not together? You know, she really wanted to understand. And I think after that interaction, I realized that I had underestimated her, that my mind obviously comes from somewhere. And if my mind can be that um, open to trying to understand things, then I should probably have trusted her more. Oh. So. Yeah, yeah. My father doesn't really talk about it, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, so you mentioned your mom uh, asked you a lot of questions. I like that first question of hers. What was your motivation? What was it? <laughs> um, she was talking about uh, the motivation of the exchange, like why I go towards it. Uh, and I would say, what did I tell her? I can't remember exactly now, but my motivation is probably that it satisfies um, my personality, that it gives me a space to be appreciated and to be creative with who I actually am rather than shutting that down in a society that doesn't necessarily want to hear my voice normally, you know? Oh, so, wow. It's actually a very cool. feminist thing to say, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right, and then um, so yeah, so you, I, I think I'm, I remember if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, you told me that you uh, you had like maybe like a community or a group that you talk to different sex workers everywhere, right? And then you're trying to combine their stories. Like, what 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 was that experience like? I mean, I, I'm I'm pretty sure it's interesting. And it's probably mm -hmm. like a whole different dynamics, right? So yeah, share with me a little bit more of that. Yeah, thank you for remembering that. That was a, a lockdown project. <laughs> I think I collected maybe 10 different stories from workers of different genders in different parts of the world. They're my friends and acquaintances, really. And I collected maybe, how long? They were they were under 10 minutes um, long uh, mon almost monologues I interviewed them but I just I took out my voice and made it just theirs and yeah and they were telling me their stories from their perspective about what sex work meant to them and it was different for everybody it was escorts it was dominatrices and it was uh, yeah people from different sectors of the industry I haven't published it or or anything yet but I have I have that collection I don't know what will happen with it, but it's it's a really nice little library, I think, of voices, which is, you know, quite important for me. What was, like, your uh, objective to, 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 to write that, I guess, to, to have that story recorded? Yeah. Um, I, similar to when I mentioned that I think it's important for people to listen to something from a first-person perspective before judging it or before blanketing it I would say that it's being a sex worker <laughs> has made me realize how closed people can be about many things and I think to hear an actual story is very important and I think as a marginalized voice it is important to speak for yourself and to be present in the world and uh, I think those were probably the motivations behind trying to give my friends a voice as well and a lot of them speak really well um, but they don't necessarily think to put it up in a podcast or on their Instagram or whatever and so I thought it would be a great opportunity for people to hear what these very intelligent insightful people within the industry have to say about their own existence mm, okay so based on that stories 
And then now you also have stories uh, and your community too, right? What do we get wrong about sex workers? What what does the public get it wrong about sex workers in general? What do they get wrong? <laughs> I think that everybody, um, I think people assume that all sex workers do not make a choice to be there. I think that can be a, a common a common thing. And of course, like with any job, <laughs> there can be people who are not making necessarily that choice. <clears throat> But um, I think also there's an element of <sighs> expecting, um, mm, yeah, I would say that we make our own choices And there's, this is such a big question for me also, because there's the issue of living in a capitalist society, you know, and within a capitalist society, uh, who is actually making a choice to work or not? And what is this choice of work? So that's one question that maybe we won't tackle today. <laughs> but but yeah, I would say that maybe the, the main thing that people get wrong is that it is something that people are not choosing to do, that it is um, exploitative in every case. And uh, yeah, maybe those are the main things yeah. that I could also attribute to capitalism. But yeah, like selling <laughs> selling your soul or selling, I guess, not selling your physic. Yeah, yeah, things like that. That's a interesting concept, right? Because um, I'm selling my time, you know, and my attention. That these are my assets. Uh, people have access to my body, sure. But the thing is, you have your body back at the end of that, also, and you were choosing to be in that scenario you know for, for me I, i don't really see where the body comes in except that somebody is trying to regulate my body and make a choice for me so yeah, yeah. It's, so it's, this is interesting because all this time i know you you're feeling very empowered by being who you are yeah which is very yeah. very fascinating for me you know whereas like the society everywhere i guess still think that there's a stigma there right? Being a sex worker. But I feel like you're being super empowered with what you do. Do you feel yeah. that way? Yeah, I think because even I came with um, preconceived stigmas and notions to to my job, you know, before I entered it, I think, and then I've, I'm very sensitive to um, how people react to me and how the world is to me. I've had to really think about it and I've had to really rationalize it. And I realize now that when it comes to these difficulties, it's not my problem. It's the issues of society at large. And so I guess that's very freeing. <laughs> yeah. And it's brought, the job has brought me so many positive aspects, whether that's the financial freedom, whether that's um, the way that my personality is given space, whether that's, Uh, the fact that my assertiveness has been even given more room to grow and be more creative, be more um, focused, you know, and so it's given me all of these positives. So I, yeah, that and understanding that it's really not my issue and it's issues of society is, it's just a liberating position to be in, I think. Oh, wow. And w when you do, yeah, like you see clients, you do your practice, I guess, uh, is, that, is it legal? To, to to have that practice. Yeah. So as long as I have a working visa wherever I am. Yeah. Yeah. Then, or wherever I'm paying my tax and it's a business trip or however, then it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty much legal. However, when it does move into uh, sexual interactions, that moves, dif differs from market to market or market to market, like um, country to country. Uh, some countries think that as long as something doesn't penetrate an orifice, it's not considered sex work. Some that don't mind at all. It's totally decriminalized, such as New South Wales, you know. And so it, it, that kind of creates, uh, yeah, differences here and there. But at the end of the day, I have a job. I pay taxes. and <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I know you do. You pay your taxes. That's interesting. So when you were in Indonesia, did you practice at all? No, it was just private. It was uh, I, I had my personal exchanges, but it was my refuge. <laughs> yeah, it was where I would sleep and then I would travel for work mostly. I really liked that separation because it can be quite intense. Mm -hmm. yeah. My interactions can be quite intense because they can go for days at a time as opposed to just hours these days. 
And so to have that base, like I even had this space in the jungle, so to speak, you know, where I didn't have neighbors and it was just like, if I left for too long, monkeys would take over my house. <laughs> yeah. So it was really like, here is your space in nature. And then now here is like your space to shift around to somebody else's mind. So it was, it, it was a good separation for me, but but yeah, yeah. And on the ground also, there's like so many Ukra things in Indonesia. So I think it was safer for me not to practice there also. Will you ever come back? Um, like I said, to sort things out, but it, it's pretty difficult, right? As with an identity as a sex worker, you're kind of living in, even if you're not practicing at the time, it leaves you in a vulnerable position. Uh, because, you know, if people decide to, however, legislate and take you to court against certain things, you're not in a in necessarily winning position. And so there's certain parts of the world where it's easier for me to um, exist more freely, even if I'm not working. And there's some societies that, uh, yeah, make it very difficult. Mm, okay. So, so you mentioned the uh, intensity of connection or relationship with, with with what you're doing, and then is it is it challenging to have a personal relationship, or is it not? I would say that it's probably made it better for me because I've started to understand how much my time and my attention is valued and worth. Yeah. And so I don't really waste my time with people who don't value that personally either these days. There really has to be more of a payoff uh, personally, not necessarily financially, than um, I would have used to accept. So there's that. And then there's also the fact that this job has taught me a lot about how to ask for what I want and to understand what I want, which I think is very useful for any relationship. And yeah, so I would say it's probably improved um, things for me. One aspect is that I probably have less people to choose from in some ways, because a lot of people would not be open to the fact that uh, I am a sex worker and how do they introduce that to the family. But on one, on the other hand, it introduces me to people who are probably strong enough to uh, look past societal limitations. So. I could see that as a pro also, actually. Interesting. So, I, okay, just let me know if you're, you're, if you're okay with me continuing with this question. Because you were right. once married. Mm. Is, that, is that something that you're okay to share? Yeah, so that one's an interesting one. Okay. Yeah. Because you, you are already a sex worker when you were married, right? Correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and your ex was okay with it. Yeah, seemingly so. <laughs> I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> I'm not sure anymore. You know, that's another thing. Like, um, so towards the beginning of our relationship, the fact that I was dominatrix seemed to be fine. And then when he found out that I had escorted before, as soon as there was penetrative sex involved, he kind of shut down a little bit. Then he thought about it and then he was okay with it. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. It's very, it's very complex. And then over time, I guess the thing is that he was probably all right with who I was, but he was maybe not okay with who he was with me. Hmm. Yeah, I think that might have been his, his issue. Interesting. Are you open to the opportunity of remarry? I think so. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> A lot of my friends are like, why? <laughs> uh, and yeah and legally can bring a lot of um complications yeah but uh but i i don't know maybe i'm <laughs> naive <laughs> or or i i kind of believe you know you only have this awareness of living this one time and mistakes are there to be made <laughs> so <laughs> enjoy enjoy them as well yeah so how uh, how do you see yourself for for like in the future? Is it something that you want to focus on this work of yours, or how do you want to evolve as Eva? How do I want to evolve? On one hand, I look far 
because I feel lucky enough to be healthy enough to have it. And on the other hand, I remember that I only have what is close. And so I only really feel what is happening now. What do I want to do with this identity? Mm. I'm happy for it to be there to support the collective effort of sex workers, but in itself, I'm, I feel very fulfilled already. I, I don't really need her to to grow in any particular way. I'm happy to just ride, ride it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, Eva, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I feel I always like see you as a very empowered woman. You're also very uh, uh, outspoken, candidly. You talk candidly about your story, which I love, you know, and you're not afraid of other people's judgment. Maybe because you trust me, I don't know, because, but I felt that comfortness from yeah. you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, other people's judgment is their own. And I'm lucky that, you know, I have enough money and movement right now to move away <laughs> from a lot of these these things uh, that they can't really hurt me, you know, physically and definitely um, psychologically anymore. And so I don't mind sharing. And if anything, I believe that sharing could maybe even help them shift for their betterment and for the betterment of all of us. So I, I see no loss in, in sharing who I am. Yeah. Oh, I love that. If, you, if there's one thing you can change about your small little worlds, what would you do? What would you contribute to that change? Like myself or the world around me? World around you, the small worlds around you. I wish that people, uh, like just people everywhere, <laughs> would be kinder to themselves so that they could give themselves an opportunity to not judge their sexuality and therefore the sexuality of the world around them, to not judge themselves and therefore be so quick to judge the world around them. I think that it really comes down to how harshly we treat ourselves as a re and as a result, it's how harshly we treat everything else. So, yeah, I, I think that would be my thing. Oh, wow. I don't know if it's going to happen, but... <laughs> that was deep, girl. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I love talking to you. I miss, talking, I miss talking to you. Seriously. This show is produced by Golden Talks and Summertime Studios. Terima kasih banyak sudah menonton atau buat kalian yang mendengarkan episode ini di podcast. Kalau kalian suka dan mudah-mudahan kalian suka ya episode ini, please like and subscribe untuk ikutin lebih banyak lagi obrolan yang berfaedah. Bantuin untuk share juga ya. Semoga makin banyak yang terbuka hati dan pikirannya.